The scripture reading for today is found in 2 Corinthians 4.3. I'm, I'm sorry, 4.7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Amen. Amen. Hello and happy Sabbath. It's a privilege to be here today to, to share with you a small journey in the Bible. We know we are now in a transition. We just have our pastor leaving to a new church, but we have another pastor coming in. We expect them to be here by the first week of September. But we also are in the midst of having a new board members. It's a, uh, uh, it's a selection committee working on getting some of the people to be appointed as the new leaders of the church. And as I mentioned, sometimes we look for excellence. We look for people that can show holiness. And that's not bad. But have we ever considered how Jesus sees us? And how Jesus deal with all of us before he brought us to church and even inside of church. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about that disciple, the one who Jesus loved the most. So sometimes when we think about biblical characters, we always put the standards very high. We expect those characters to be somehow perfect. So we, when we talk about Job, we see somebody that God refers to him as an upright person. In other translations, it says he was perfect. And we want to be like Job. That's not bad. We sometimes want to be like Elijah. Some other people would like to be like Elijah. Or even Daniel. When the Bible talks about Daniel, it says that the spirit of Daniel was a superior spirit. So somehow makes you feel an idea that our spirit is kind of too little to go to the level of Daniel. We also expect that these biblical characters are error-free or sin-free. And when we talk about them, we think that they never committed anything. They were always pure souls. And therefore, they are also holy We also believe that these people, they have good character. So every time they come to talk to you, they come with a big smile. Hi, brother, how are you? They find you a cut to when you were sinning, and instead of the, you see a bad face, you see somebody smiling at you. Oh, my dear brother, Jesus loves you. And you expect that, to read that in the Bible. But let me talk, introduce you this morning about someone very special. John the disciple. Was he all of those characteristics that we mentioned? Just, was he that special that he can be on the Bible? He can be named the one who Jesus loved the most? Let's see some of the uh, things about John. And, I have only taken into consideration just a few things about John because I just want to focus the life of John while he was with Jesus because the transformation that John had right after, it was huge. So there is a lot to talk about John. But I'm going to talk about John only the time that he spent with Jesus, like three years and a half. That's the most he did. So the Bible said that John has two parents, one of them was uh, Zebedee and his mother, Salome. And another translation gives him another name. He happened to have a brother 
named James. He was the older brother. John was the younger brother. And he was also one of the youngest disciples that Jesus had. So he, let's say that he was, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say a number, but let's say that he had like 18 years old when he started to follow Jesus. He was very young. But both brothers, they have a nickname. They were named like Bonerges or Bonerges. And that means sons of thunders. So I'm going to leave that to you so that you can think in your mind, why did God mention this in the Bible? And put it right there. And also, they were the first disciple John the Baptist. Before they met to Jesus, they were following John the Baptist. So John the Baptist was talking about the Messiah that was going to come. They had to repent because the kingdom of heaven was at hand. And John and James, they were listening to that. And maybe they were baptized by John the Baptist. Later, they, they heard that John was talking about the Messiah. And then John uh, talked to them, John the Baptist talked to them about the Lamb of God that he just baptized. We read in the book of John in the first chapter that Jesus going by, and then John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, there it is, the Lamb of God. And John and James are following Jesus at that moment. At that moment, they were not disciples. They were just following Jesus. Later, they are called. But also, something very interesting. John used to lean on Jesus' shoulders. So every time Jesus was talking with them, he was leaning on Jesus all the time, like a little boy does with his father. Father is talking to the little boy, and the little boy goes to lean on his father and tries to listen all the teaching that his father does. But one day, John lost control of himself. He was sent, he, there was a mission, they were going to Jerusalem the last week of Jesus, and Jesus said, okay, we need to go to uh, uh, this uh, Samaritan city, and we need to lodge there for the evening, and then keep going to Jerusalem. But when the people heard that they were just passing by and they were heading to Jerusalem, they didn't want to keep him there. So they said, no, we don't have a place for you to stay. And John heard that he got so mad that he said, hey, do you want us to pray so the fire come from heaven and burn them? I was in the spirit of John. But also something interesting, three important things that happened to the life of John. Things that he witnessed. The first, the transfiguration. Almost the last week in the life of Jesus. And he's going to the mountain to pray, and he brought... Peter, James, and John to help him praying, but they were so tired that they fall asleep. All of a sudden, Moses and Elijah show, so showing support to Jesus. And at that moment, the glory of Jesus come to him. So at that moment, the divinity of Jesus shows, and they woke up, and they saw that moment when Jesus he wasn't human in that moment. He was God. He also witnessed at the moment when Jairus' daughter was resurrected. If we remember the story, Jairus went to talk to Jesus, but Jesus was so busy uh, speaking to a woman that her, his daughter passed away. So Jesus has to come to his house. And when he came to Jairus', uh, to Jairus house, and he said, you know, that little girl is sleeping. The people start mocking at Jesus. Say, hey, he doesn't understand what death means. So Jesus only brought the parents of that little girl, Peter, James, and John one more time onto the room. And, and right there, he prayed. And John saw how that little girl who was dead, now is back alive. And the third thing John witnessed, the crucifixion of Jesus. That was a troubled time. On one side, Peter was crying bitterly because he has denied his master. On another side of town, Judah is taking his life because he 
thought that what he was doing was right, but he thought it was not okay, and he took it the wrong way. The other disciples, they're scared. They're hiding because whatever they did to Jesus, they're going to do it to us too. So the only one right there in the cross is John and Maria and Mary. That moment could be very painful to John. He heard Jesus talking a lot of things, but at that moment when we are in pain, we forgot a lot of things that people say to us. We forgot all the promises. And, and he was there, like maybe trying to set his mind right. Why is my master here? He was talking about a life forever. He was going to be the king, the Messiah. And now he's hanging there, just about to die. And he saw him die. Now, let me ask you a question What would you do with a man like John? with all of that flaws of character. Would you call John an elder from that church? Would you like John to be your deacon? Would you like John to be your Sabbath school teacher that every time you disagree with him, he will get mad? Would you like him to be? Let's see how Jesus deal with John. First of all, he called into the ministry. What? Yeah. Jesus called him to the ministry. And when John was called to the ministry, he didn't have that knowledge of the Bible like some of us might do now. He was just listening in John the Baptist a little bit, and then he started following Jesus. He saw the miracles being performed, but he didn't know that much. Sometimes we expect people to come to church, and when we uh, ask them to serve in any position at church, we expect them to, for them to be a theological he can give us lectures and everything. That he can know the Bible from cover to cover. But when John was called, he didn't have the knowledge. So Jesus says in Matthew 4, 21 and 22, that Jesus was, work, uh, was walking by the Sea of Galilee. And he has been praying all night to select his disciples. And on that walk, the first two that he finds is Peter and Andrew, both are brothers. Then Jesus keeps walking, and as he keeps walking, he, uh, verse 21 says, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. As we recall the Bible, every time they mention names, they always mention names from older to younger, or the firstborn, and, for, and so on. So when they mentioned first Simon and then Andrew, then Simon or Peter was older and Andrew was younger. And the same way here, James was older and John was the younger. So Jesus found these two men, uh, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their fathers, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and follow him. Now, I have a question for you. If you know the character of a person, if you have been living with that person, and you know how that character is, would you assign them a special task that might be going against the character that they have? Would you select Let's say a woman that had a bad character to play with your children or lead a department or have to deal with a lot of children that you know dealing with children is the most difficult task ever. You, you can't have them control. You got special skills. And it is almost the same thing. John, he wasn't like a very uh, patient man. But Jesus called him. Let's say what Ellen White has to say about it. And our father cares, Ellen White says, all the disciples had serious faults when Jesus called them to his service. Even John, who came into close association with the, meek, with the, uh, with the meek and, and lowly one, was not himself naturally meek 
and yielded. He and his brother were called the sons of thunder. While they were with Jesus, and its light shone to him, around their indignation and combativeness, evil temper, revenge, the spirit of criticism, were all in the beloved disciple. He was proud and ambitious to be first in the kingdom of God. Wow, do you know that? Do you remember one day that all the disciples are together and out of the sudden the mother of James and John come to talk to Jesus? Just to, to paraphrase the story, make it a little short. She came to talk to Jesus and say, hey, Lord, I need to ask you one thing. So, what do you want? Just one thing. When you are king, I want my son James and John to be on the either side of you. And Jesus got upset because Jesus said, you don't know what you're asking for. That was the spirit of John. And we sometimes we don't see John like that. He wanted to be the first in the kingdom of God. He was proud. He has an evil temper, revenge, a spirit of criticism. We don't see that much. But how did Jesus deal with that? The thing Jesus said, hmm, maybe I should run. I should put John aside and may bring someone else. You know how Jesus deal with things like this? Yeah. He sent them to work. He sent him to minister with all the disciples. How come? Yeah. They need to work. But before they work, Jesus did something special. He prayed for all of them all night. And after he prayed, uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 2, he said that he called them and said, you know, you're going to have to go and preach on this town. But first of all, you need to go to Jerusalem. And I'm going to give you special powers. You can cast out demons. You can heal, heal any disease. And you can also bring people from death. They have all of that power. And then when you go into every city, you need to preach this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, it's interesting to read right here on Matthew 10, 2 to 5, that Jesus make no exception. He didn't say, oh, you know, it's going to go only Matthew, uh, maybe Nathaniel and Philip. No, he sent all of them. Now the name of the 12 apostles are this. First, Simon. He was the first call. Uh, it's called Peter. Second, Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee. And John, his brother. John was also included in that group. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphael, and Elavos, whose name is Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanite, and who else? Judas. Is carried out, who also betrayed him. Even that was in that group. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentile, and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. But before they go, Jesus provided them with the special skills. They give them all this power with the Holy Spirit so they can perform all of these things as needed. How do Ellen White mention this? She says on the side of ages, the Savior knew the character of the man whom he has chosen. How can we say, or what can we say about Peter? He always wanted to be the first one, but also he denied the master. One day when Jesus was being captured, he threw his sword and don't think that he just wanted to show the sword to the uh, soldier. He wanted to kill them. He tried, but he missed. What about Thomas? He was with Jesus, but when he passed away, what did Thomas say? Yeah. 
Well, I won't believe that he just came back to life until I put my hand on his side and see the sign of the nail on his hands. Remember Philip? Oh, Jesus, just show me the Father. I'm going to be done with that. that. That's enough. Show me the Father. All of the disciples have flaws in character. The Savior knew the character of them whom he had chosen. All their wickedness and errors were open before him. He knew the petals, petals through which they must pass the responsibility that would rest upon them and his heart yearned over these chosen ones. Alone upon a mountain near the Sea of Galilee, he spent the entire night in prayer for them while they were sleeping at the foot of the mountain. See? So Jesus said, okay, the only way to fix this, I need to send them to work. But I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to give them the Holy Spirit that they needed to perform all the things. Jesus believed in them even though they weren't the best characters to choose from. Maybe there were other people. Remember that later we talk about uh, this deacon who was uh, killed? Remember? Stephen? He was a better spirit. Why didn't Jesus call him first? Instead, he called these 12 people or 12 men with a lot of flaws, with a lot of errors, with difficulty with their own characters. But let me tell you something too. Every time they did something wrong, Jesus, Jesus just fixed it right there. And that is the moment when John did something that Jesus didn't like. They were going to Jerusalem and Jesus asked, hey, go into this Samaritan village and ask them, for a place to in, to stay. Because people, Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. They didn't want them to stay. So they said, no, we don't have any place for you. So those messengers came back to Jesus and said, you know, they don't want us to stay there. And the Bible says in Luke 9, 54, 56, that James and John heard this. And when they saw this, they said, and look at what he said. Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? See how he was twisting the words and, the, and he was twisted something that happened some time ago? He said, if I pray to heaven, fire will come down from heaven and will burn this. But not only me, remember that Elijah did it. He was mixing all of everything. He didn't have the knowledge. And he got it wrong. Because first of all, Elijah did not ask for uh, fire from heaven to burn the city. No. Elijah did not ask for fire. He asked for God to accept the sacrifice and to show the people that he was the right God. And you can see this on 1 Kings chapter 18. And the third who sent fire from heaven to eat that offering, it was God. It's not something that Elijah asked for. But he has all the facts wrong. You want us to pray to heaven so that fire comes and burn the city? <laughs> what do you think Jesus did? Oh, John, you need to go to school back for time. Read First King 18, fast 40 days, and then come and talk. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. I like the way Jesus addressed issues. Jesus turned back and said, you do not know what manner of a spirit you are of. In other words, he, he told them, and he went back to him and said, hey, you forgot that you're Christians. 
you forgot that you had the Holy Spirit. Because what happens when you have the Holy Spirit? You do the things of the Spirit. And when you are a Christian, you're supposed to be doing the thing of the Spirit. So these two things have to be together. You cannot be a Christian and do the things of the flesh. And you cannot be uh, people who follow following the Holy Spirit and do the things of the flesh because they don't match. So Jesus went just to the root of the problem. John, you've been here with me for almost three years and you don't understand everything I've been doing. And I believe that John felt himself pride. He said, you know, I have this power. And every time I pray for somebody to come back to life, they come back to life. If I pray for somebody to heal, they heal. If I cast out demons, they are gone. So he saw that he had that power. And at that moment, he lost it. And Jesus has to come back and fix it. And say, hey, the root of the problem is that you don't know what the spirit you're made of. And then Jesus told him the right way, you know, you forgot that the whole ministry, oh my, is not to destroy men, but to save them. Sometimes, my brother, we forgot the mission of this church. The mission of the church is not to come here on Sabbath and just sit here and listen to the sermon or participate in Sabbath school. The mission of the church is to save people. You are here because somebody thought in your salvation and brought you here. And that's something that we need to do all the time. Keep bringing people to be safe because that's all about the ministry. It's nice that we have pot like we share, we mingle. But every time we do that, we should do it so that we can save more people. Everything, every ministry, the children ministry, pathfinders, Sabbath school, every ministry, the Lord, the command is to save people. That's what Jesus came for. That's all about Jesus' ministry, to save people. What does any white have to say about this? Remember the quote that we were reading about our father's cares, about John? It said, evil temper, revenge, the spirit of criticism were all in the beloved disciple. He was proud and ambitious to be first in the kingdom of God. But Ellen White keeps saying, hey, you know, this was the past in the life of John. Because what did John did on his behalf? Day by day, in contrast with his own violent spirit, he beheld the tenderness and forbearance of Jesus and heard his lesson of humility and patience. How do you feel when your spirit is so violent? And every time you go to talk to your mom and your dad, instead of he pulling your ears and saying, you need to be here today, you need to be grounded, they just hug you and say, you know, I love you. You're going to learn better tomorrow. You're going to do better tomorrow. How do you feel? You feel like, oops, I did really, really did something wrong. He doesn't have to tell you much because you understand that you did something wrong. And day by day, John was learning that. He opened his heart to the divine influence and became not only a hearer, but a doer of the Savior's words. I remember um, one pastor from Chile was talking about a story. And he said that in Chile, they were about to celebrate Father's Day. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church came up with the idea of create an advertisement for television. And on this, on this advertisement, he was showing a grown up man that get up from bed and went to the bathroom and start shaving. And as he was shaving, the camera started to focus the little boy who was next to the dad, and he grabbed some 
shaved screen, put it on his face, and it started to look like he was shaving too. So he, he finished shaving, he goes to back to his room, put his suit and shoes, and the little boy is following him and he put a jacket, a towel jacket, and put it on top of him, and he started walking be, behind his dad. On the way to uh, the door, he just stumbled with one of the uh, tables and there was a glass, and this glass fell down. So the father come back and put the glass up one more time and he be going. So the little boy come and get the glass, put it down, and then put it back on, and then keep going and following his father. So when he goes to the outside, the father keeps walking to the car, and the boy see that he, the footprints of his father are too big. So when he put his feet, he said that his feet are too little to the uh, feet of his father. So he went back running to the, his father's room, got some shoes of his father, put them on, and then he comes back and follow his dad. So at that moment, the Seventh-day Adventist Church put happy Father's Day. But remember, your son is watching. And I, I loved it. And it's the same thing that happened here with Jesus and John. Jesus didn't celebrate everything John did. Even though he wasn't happy, he just come and talked to him. Hey, this is not the way. But then he showed him on his own example how he could be the life. Humility. Patience, something that John did maybe never heard about. But he learned from the master. So, what did Jesus do then in order to change this character? And this is something that we need to learn too. The first thing that Jesus did is to show him that the most important part is the message. Why? Because sometimes we look at ourselves and say, oh, you know, I went to the university, I have a bachelor's degree, and then I went back and then I have a PhD degree or a master's degree, so I am someone. No, that's not important. The important is the message. And that's what 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Other versions say it's clay yards that the excellence of the power might be of God and not of us. You know, my brother, the country I come from, you can get clay from anywhere. And it's free. You don't have to pay for it. You just go to the garden, start digging, and one foot or two, you will find clay. And you can do whatever you want with clay. You can do dishes, pots, coffee pots, mugs, everything. And if you don't like it, toss them away and make new ones. That's no value at all. What is valuable is what's inside. And this is what the Bible is saying. We have these treasures in earthen vessels. Why? Because sometimes we believe that what we provide to the church is what church benefits benefit from, but it's not that. If what God can do through us is what the church gets benefit from. So in this way, it doesn't matter what background we have or what background we don't have because it's God's words the most important thing that we need to do. And it was say, God has pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies. What would it happen if God decided, hey, you know what? In order to save human beings, I'm going to send a legion of angels to do my work. Jesus could have done that. And we could be in heaven right now. And what could have been done? Nothing. He could do that. But he chose us. Because in the same way that we were talking about Sabbath school this morning, Sometimes you don't feel the pain of God until you feel that pain when you're losing your child or your daughter or someone you love to some sort of addiction or decision that they're making. And there, your pain 
you cry, you pray, you beg, you do everything you can. And you see how that's slipping off your hands. But you keep doing it, and you keep doing it. Guess what? A few days later, maybe weeks, maybe months, sometimes years, you see that person come back. And now you rejoice. You didn't expect that person to go that far. But now you rejoice because that person is back. That's why Jesus chose us. So that we can understand how heaven deals with us every day. Because we're not just like a beautiful chips. We might be black chips. Or almost great. He himself, by his Holy Spirit, qualified men and enabled them to do his work. So it's the Holy Spirit through us that helps us to do the, the work that God needs. It's not my ability. It's not my skills. It's the Holy Spirit working in me that's helping me. He guided the mind in the isolation of what to speak and what to write. The treasure was entrusted to earthen vessels. Yet, it is nonetheless from heaven. You know, sometimes when I, I'm going to prepare a sermon, I, in my mind I have like, okay, I would like to preach about this. So I pray, God, and sometimes I say, okay, God, at the end of the day, I want to know what I'm going to preach. So I put in my mind what I need to preach. And out of the sudden, I get a Bible text, and I get another Bible text, and I, when I go home, I start writing all Bible texts, and one after the other, and then I go like, oops, you know what? This can be better for this sermon. Maybe it's not what I planned. <laughs> but when I start organizing, oh, this sounds even better. And I, another verse come in, and oh, I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to add it here. And at the end, I have my sermon. Maybe it's not even close to what I wanted at the beginning. But that's how this Holy Spirit works. Sometimes those who have been also speakers here know that we are talking about something and all of a sudden, oops, another verse coming, another idea. Amen. And you go, how did that happen? And people say, hey, you know, your sermon was so beautiful, but no, it wasn't us. It's not to do with us. It's the Holy Spirit. Amen. And this is what it's saying here. And that message is from heaven. The testimony is conveyed through the imperfect expression of human language. Yet, it is the testimony of God, and the obedient, believing child of God beholds in it the glory of a divine power, full of grace and truth. So salvation is not about us. It's not about what we can do. Salvation is about that message that we have in our heart that we need to share. Because that's the power. That is the powerful message because it came from God. That's what Jesus used to help transform John. Second, and the first time I read this, it hurt my feelings. Why? We're going to read it. Jesus shows fallen beings. How come? Let's read 1 Corinthians one twenty seven. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world. What did he choose? <laughs> the foolish things. To put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world. What? The strong? No, the weak to put to shame the things which are mighty. So, when I heard this the first time, I, I thought like, okay, I have an education, I, I have this knowledge, and I have this background, I believe that I'm clever, smart, intelligent, everything. But when I read this, I said, oops, my standard is not the same standard as God. God looked at me as a foolish and as a weak. And it's true. When you look yourself back 
and you see all the bad choices that you made in your life. God is true on that statement. You, did, you see how many wrongs doing you did, how many bad choices you did, and maybe you are here because of those bad choices. God's right. But also he's saying this because sometimes we also put too much uh, importance to the human being, oh, us. No. That's not the point. Those whom God shows are his workers are not always talented in the estimation of the word. Sometimes he selects unlearned men. And let me tell you about this uh, quick story about this. On my early years of being an Adventist, I was in a church, at, at the church, and there was a ceremony. And this ceremony, one uh, old lady, she was being awarded. You know why? On that year, she had brought to church almost 27 or 30 something people to baptize. Just her, not the whole church, just her. And I said, wow, that lady should be awesome. And I was thinking to myself, maybe she has some kind of method or she's a talent that she's. I, I, in my mind, it was like, wow, she maybe it's a major university. Would you just a common, regular, single lady? Nothing to expect from. And then somebody kicked me and said, you know what? That lady doesn't even know how to read or write. I said, how come? I was like, I don't believe it. And then they tell, she talked about the testimony, how she made that. She didn't know how to read or write. So what she did, uh, church back then, they have a, a booklet. And it has like 18 Bible studies. So when somebody told you, hey, can I have a Bible study? You had that small book with 18 lessons. He had like five questions each. And every question has an answer with a Bible text. So you go to the people, pray for the lesson, and then ask the first question, and then you say, okay, go to your Bible and this Bible text, and then you, they find the answer. It's so, so easy. And at the end, there are also three questions that is a confirmation. Do you understand what you just read? What are you going to do about this? And the last one is, are you willing to accept Jesus? And, and, and it's over and over on the actual lessons. So the lady used to come to do the Bible study with her Bible, but she couldn't read, with her book, brought it, get to these people, and it's okay, we're gonna start the Bible study, we pray, so here is your book, and this is the Bible. So, we're lesson number one. So, the first question, what does it say? And the person reads, oh, the first question it is, blah, 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 blah. So she goes, okay, find in that Bible, that text that is on John 1, chapter 17. And that person went to read and, and had trouble reading and said, no, you know, let me tell you. The text is read, says this, 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 and this. And people go, wow, so what is, it? what is the answer? And people say, oh, the answer is this. Okay, write it down. And she finishes. At the end, she made a call to the person and said, do you like to baptize? Yeah, I want to baptize. And they brought it to church. And the pastor said, oh, I'm so happy to, that you're here because our sister has been talking about you. And you know what? They know. She can't even read or write. Oh, come, I just got a Bible study from her. <laughs> you're lying to me. No. And she said, you know what I do? I pray, but I memorize all the inserts. I have everything in my mind. And that's how she used to do the Bible study. Does she need to be a, an expert on bachelor degree or engineer? No. And that's what Ellen White said. His workers are not always talented in the estimation of the work. Sometimes he select unlearned men. These workers have a special work to do. They reach a class to which no one else could obtain access. Those who labor in a quiet way will be rewarded with the name commendation with the same combination as those who from outward appearances 
exerted a wider influence. Sometimes when I hear the testimonies about uh, Alejandro Bullon, he's one of the Peruvian uh, pastors in South America. And one of his conferences a few years ago, he baptized 10,000 people in one month. And I go, wow, what a man. But you know what? That lady that brought 27 and Pastor Bujon, they both will be rewarded in the same way. There is no higher or better because they all will retain the same salvation. That's all we need. Every worker is rewarded according to the spirit that prompts him to action. So my brothers, this is what Jesus did. And the other thing that he did, let me see the last one. He molded the characters. How do you do that? Jeremiah, he was a prophet in a very troubled time. He has a prophet that has to tell his people, you know, you're going to suffer because you're disobedient. You don't follow God. So God will take you into captivity. And they, they say, you know, that, he's not talking from God. And he has a lot of troubles. That's why uh, some people recognize him as a whining prophet. He was always whining and crying and everything. People never listened to him. And one day, God talked to Jeremiah. He said, you know, you need to go to the porter's house. Why? You just go. So when Jeremiah went down to that porter's house, he saw this, that he was working with this clay, and he was trying to make a vessel, and out of the halfway, that vessel broke, broke apart. So the potter, he just made a different shape of the vessel, and he made another one. And then God talked to Jeremiah and says, Oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you at this potter? Said the Lord. Look as the clay is in the potter's hand. So are you in my hand, O house of Israel. So John put himself in the hands of Jesus. And Jesus made the right vessel with him. He shaped his soul, his character, his life, everything he made anew. And why make a, a call to all of us today? who will consent even now, after wasting much of his lifetime, to give his will as clay into the hands of the potter and cooperate with God in becoming in the hands molded a vessel unto honor. Oh, how must the clay be in the hands of the potter? How susceptible to receive divine impressions, extended in the bright beams of the righteousness, no earthly, no selfish motives should be suffered to live. For, it, for if you give them place, you cannot be him into the divine image. The spirit of truth sanctifies the soul. So brother, if you are being considered for being a leader from church, for this church, accept the call. Because Jesus is doing to do with you the same thing that he did with John. He can change your mind, your spirit. He make new of you. But you need to put yourself in his hands. Follow his footsteps. Do everything he wants you to do. And he will help you. He will also be praying for you. Don't say no. So, John was transformed. Let me tell you a quick story of somebody that changed my mind about how God worked with people. I was in a, I was in, a, I was baptized in one church and then I was relocated on another one because there was lack of leaders. So they asked me, can you, would you like to move to this church to help this church to Keep growing. There was few people there. And as we kept working, out of the sudden, the other church called me and said, hey, would you like to come this Sabbath and, and have the sermon? And I said, sure. 
So I went for a visit, and one of my uh, friends said, why don't you have the Sabbath school? So it was like a church like this, and the Sabbath school classes were divided on computers. So I had the class here in the front, and there was one guy right in the back that he was very loud. And you know, when I speak, I, I speak in volume one, so people can barely hear me sometimes. But it's in my nature, I can't speak louder. I don't know why, but I try. So I was trying to t- teach my class, and that guy at the back, he was just like, like a Pentecost pastor. He was shouting and screaming and moving his hand. And I was like, oh, I hope this man shut up because I can't teach my class. I was so upset that he was like, see, brothers, see. And all the people were like, yeah, yeah. And he was taking all the attention of all the classes. There were six, and he was making all the noise. So I was like, oh, I, I don't like this man. I don't like it at all. Somebody needs to talk to him. But I started realizing that when I was coming back from the other church, after greeting everybody and leaving, I was coming back home, and on the road, I saw this man around 1 p.m., 1.30 in the afternoon, when the sun is hitting the most. He, he was walking with his Bible, behind him, his wife, his two daughters, and after them, the whole class. And most of them was like old ladies, 70s, 80s under the sun, and they were walking almost every Sabbath night, going like, what's going on with this man? Why did he bring in all these people at the sunlight? Why don't he wait until the sun just come down a little bit and then go out and, be, and may visit the Bible study? So I was so upset. I thought that maybe I need to go ahead and talk to this man, because he doesn't know how we do things at church. <laughs> but one day, one of those ladies sent me a message and says, I need you to go to my house because I'm sick and I want you to pray for me. So I came to her house and I started talking to her and talking. And out of the sudden she said, you know, we are very sad at church. And I said, why? Because remember, brother, uh, he told me the name and I remember that was the guy. He said, he left church, and I was, yes, finally that man left church because he was so noisy and loud, and, and I don't want to find him at the church anymore. And then she said, you know, we are very sad because we love him the way he teaches our Sabbath school class. We have found no one like him. And every day we used to visit all the other churches, all the other elders from church. And now we cannot do it because he left church. You know how I feel? I'm the most miserable man on earth. <laughs> because sometimes we believe that people should be like us. Oh, if he's not like me, he's not good. No. We forgot that God calls every one of us because we're different. And every one of us are put in some location of which no, maybe I cannot reach, but you can. And that's why God chose you. John was transformed in such a way that when he was writing his gospel, he didn't like to talk about him, like, oh, me, John. He talked about him in third person. So when he's talking about him on John 20, he receives the message from Mary Magdalene that she had gone to the uh, burial place and the body of Jesus not found. So he received that, that news, the body of Jesus is not there. And he writes this. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, who? The other. Whom Jesus loved. How he called himself, I am the one who Jesus loved. When John wrote his gospel, it was like 30 years or 35 years after Jesus went back to heaven. And until that moment, he realized 
that Jesus loved him. Brother, Jesus loved all of us. It doesn't matter the differences that we might see in each other. He loves that. And he died for every one of you and even for me. So, if you want to work with Jesus and be transformed, say yes. God bless you. And then we're going to uh, find him, 507. And if you find him, please stand. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for all the blessings you have given us, Father. Thank you for bringing us here to study your word. But also thank you for showing us the example of John. Even though he wasn't the best man, when you took it on your hands, he became a great disciple, Father. He became a great, great speaker for your word. Please help us also to follow the example of John, to put our lives in your hand so you can mold us, so that you can reshape our characters. But most of all, Father, that we share this treasure that you have given us. That we bring someone else to be saved as well, Father. Let us not forget, Father, that our business is the salvation of people. Help us to bring those people and bless this church. Bless Pastor Titus. Bless Pastor Nelson, Father. And that we all can work together, not only on this earth, but to go to heaven. We ask you this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you.